Good afternoon. Uh, on behalf of all my uh, wonderful Barnes colleagues, I want to welcome you to this virtual member talk and thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, we are incredibly grateful to all of our members for the critical support that you provide to the Barnes. I also want to thank the members of the 1922 Barnes Legacy Society uh, who have made a commitment to the institution's future by including the Barnes in their estate plans. Before we get started, I want to invite you to participate in today's talk in the chat. Um, I'll be in the chat with you. We'll have some time for Q&A at the end. Um, thank you to everyone sort of saying hello as we kick off here. Um, and feel free to post your questions throughout. So um, we'll take a look. We'll get them queued up and ready to go. Our speaker today, Michael Williamson, is a member of the Barnes Art Team, and he has been a teacher of studio art and survey art history at Germantown Front School. He completed his BA at Yale University, received an MFA in painting at Bard College. When not at the Barnes Foundation, Michael pursues his painting, art practice, and exhibits work in the Delaware Valley area. So without further ado, I will turn you over to Michael. Okay, um, good afternoon. I'm going to start with a uh, quote, and the quote is one that I find that is really interesting, and it um, creates a sense of sort of wonder and magic. And it's a quote from a title from a Paul Gauguin painting. Where do we come from? What are we? Where are we going? And I think that this really underscores like the sort of the power of art and the power of stories uh, to tell us about sort of lives long ago or even um, currently. So uh, my talk today is entitled The Ballet Door in Context. And I wanted to give sort of a larger understanding of the door sort of beyond the, um, the aesthetic qualities that obviously are incredibly important. I'm going to also toggle between reading a little bit and then sort of speaking more extemporaneously. Um, it's my goal in this discussion to examine the door, uh, the ballet door, uh, in the collection of the Barnes Foundation, not only as an aesthetic object, but also as an expression of the cultural and spiritual life of the ballet people of West Africa. The door had great significance to Dr. Barnes as an object of aesthetic beauty and as an object imbued with power and mystery. In his writings from the 1920s, when he first acquired the bulk of his African sculpture uh, from the French dealer Paul Guillaume, uh, he envisioned ancient Negro sculpture as a vital sort of cultural currency for the American uh, new Negro to claim pride of place alongside equal in artistry to the art of uh, Europe. The idea of equality among the races, uh, political, artistic, and cultural context in 1920s America was a stance that Dr. Barnes uh, boldly staked his reputation on as a collector and as a largely self-taught art scholar. He engaged the great African-American minds of the day to join him in extolling the value of what he called ancient Negro sculpture. Alain Locke, who um, was a also a Central High School graduate, as was Dr. Barnes. Uh, Locke went on to uh, graduate from Harvard University. He was a Rhodes Scholar and the writer of a manifesto called The Legacy of Ancestral Hearts. Uh, Dr. Barnes also enlisted uh, Charles Johnson, uh, who went on to become the first Black president of the historically uh, Black uh, Fisk University, and then Arthur Fawcett, another uh, Central High School graduate. Um, he was a revered public school teacher, a folklorist, and anthropologist. So Barnes was really intending, the quote here is, to try to have the best private collection of Negro sculpture in the world. Dr. Barnes saw in um, ancient Negro sculpture, old form, uh, syncopated rhythms, and uniting harmonies, uh, that he felt were also intrinsic to the American Negro spirituals he loved and he learned um, of when he was about eight years old. Often during the early years of the Barnes Foundation, Dr. Barnes would host musical recitals of Negro spirituals in the main gallery. Now, 
uh, in close reading of uh, Dr. Barnes' writing from the 1920s uh, regarding African sculpture, we see both his revolutionary vision and the limitations of his somewhat romanticized view of African art. Both Dr. Barnes and Paul Guillaume placed most of the African sculpture in the collection uh, with the dates that range from before the 10th century uh, through the 15th century. We now know much of the sculpture dates from the late 19th century and early 20th century. In fact, it's really kind of co contemporaneous with um, the development of sort of post-impressionism in the early moderns. Uh, on the May 1926 cover of Opportunity Journal of Negro Life, the ballet door has the grandiose title, Temple Door of the 16th Century. In African Art in the Barnes Foundation, Susan Mullen Vogel describes it simply as a door for an inner room. What I've come to discern is to see this door as typical of a granary door as I've been looking at other types of doors and what their functions are. What Dr. Barnes seemed to intuitively understand, however, was the aesthetic power of the work its spiritual depth, and the legacy of all world cultures to create meaning and beauty reflecting their worldview. He also deeply valued the voices of African-American scholars of his day, urging them to tell the story of African art. So it's essential to me to grasp the scale of the continent of Africa as this helps us understand the variety and the range of material objects created by the African people. The socio-political uh, effect of colonialism on the continent cannot be ignored. West African indigenous groups whose lands were reconstituted in colonial times lumped together groups to, uh, in ways that merged traditions, experiences, and cultures. Groups living by the Atlantic shore or the grassland savanna or the interior forests have different materials available. Most objects are made of wood. The traditions of carving or weaving are handed down generation to generation. Wood and raffia rot, but to the tradition of making and creating go on. The Baole people are descended from the Akan people. And you can see sort of on the map on the, uh, on the left, little circle, red circle, where it says Côte d'Ivoire, that's Ivory Coast. Uh, they traditionally lived in family compounds with a head chief, the oldest being um, uh, the oldest son, a revered leader, and then his wife, wife or wives, and then um, other brothers and their wives and um, lived in the compound. And there'd be a, sort of a low wall uh, surrounding that compound. There, um, would be a collective granary that holds the wealth, the health, and the spiritual continuity of the community. And that major uh, sort of granary would be um, sort of in the sort of next to the head chief. Um, and it's likely that our door is a granary door. The core food crops for the ballet are sorghum and uh, sweet potatoes. They also have chickens and they have other things. And sweet potatoes are pretty much a, um, a sort of cash crop and they can use that for trade. And sorghum is the core. And sorghum, when it's threshed, is like sand and it pours like sand or like water. And when it's uh, threshed, um, when it's unthreshed, um, it's, uh, you, can, you can cook it easily. It's kind of like um, a hominy grits. Uh, and it can be as fluid in sand, as, as sand when it's stored. And the granaries are said to resemble the bellies of pregnant uh, women. So the examples that I have here of the granaries are reconstructions of granary, granaries. Now people would probably use brick, uh, cinder block, uh, and have a corrugated roof. Uh, but this is kind of a tradition, traditional look of a village. And uh, that the work of building the granaries is shared uh, between men and women, and it's also very gendered. So the men tend to do sort of the gathering of the wood, the cutting of the wood, and the creating of the structure in wood, 
and then women will uh, dig to get clay and they'll add cow dung and straw and they will do sort of a clay work. So it's kind of divided um, into, along uh, gender lines. Of course, here, all of these are reproductions of people building uh, granaries. And so here is a woman who is uh, creating uh, a large granary. You can look at the granary almost as if it's like a, a coil pot made out of terracotta, and it's just very, very large. And you can see that she's taking sort of roughly uh, uh, made uh, blocks and putting th them together on top of a um, a base that has uh, that has uh, mud brick on the bottom, and then you can see this close up where you can see uh, the idea of using cow dung and clay and straw may seem um, unusual. I've done this in uh, South Africa and in Botswana. The clay, the cow dung is very dry and it doesn't smell at all. You can use your bare hands. Uh, to create this. And you can see in this picture, again, a reconstruction, is that they're placing a door within sort of the walled structure of a granary. And in this case, the wood looks like it comes from Home Depot. Uh, there's a lock that you could buy, buy at, uh, at Lowe's, and there are um, metal hinges. But again, this is a reproduction, but you can see sort of how it uh, fits together. And this is a more traditional uh, granary, and you can see in the granary to the left, uh, the carved uh, door. So this is why I've come to the uh, conclusion that this is a granary door. It could have been a door for the walled entrance into the compound, but it's a little small for that. Uh, it could be the door for the chief's house, but again, it would be pretty narrow for people to try to get through. So uh, it seems as if the granary door is the likely um, thing that it is. So uh, once the granary is built, people would uh, use the blood of a sacrificial chicken and anoint the interior. And the idea is to ward off evil spirits. In fact, the door itself is less a functional door to stop people from going in, but it's more um, a boundary door to uh, ward off um, evil spirits to ward off curious children. And I think we should think about the sort of the actual function of a door because it's a boundary and the boundary exists between uh, those who possess knowledge about what's inside uh, and those who don't. Uh, there are boundaries that we experience in all kinds of aspects of our lives, spatial, social, and spiritual. The spatial in sort of in terms of uh, seating and, and houses of faith based on gender. There might be a rude screen that separates the congregation from the high altar in the synagogue, the bima, the ark, uh, they hold and protect the Torah. And then socially, there's the red carpet, there's velvet rope. Uh, we should look at um, these doors as boundaries. They're also spiritual. Um, and I would like us to think maybe about the door being less of an art object and more of a reliquary, an object that is used in very powerful uh, symbolic ways uh, and perhaps also in rituals. Um, when I was looking at the description and the uh, building of works using uh, mud, brick, and wood, I was thinking about, well, in other cultures, this happens as well. So this is just a little side, sort of side example of a sort of Tudor building. It's uh, timber framed with wattle and daub. Wattle and is the uh, wooden part, which is usually made of willow and it's kind of woven together. It fits within the framework of the, um, of the building. And then of course, then clay is placed in that. And you can see that the structure, uh, on, especially on the right, you can see how it's been sort of stuccoed with the mud. And then of course, it's got a thatched roof. And if the thatched roof uh, extends beyond the walls and a little bit beyond the foundation, then that will protect the building um, in the rain. And uh, we know that Tudor buildings can last for a long time, as would um, a granary um, in uh, Cote d'Ivoire. I had the experience of traveling many years ago to South Africa and to Botswana and to actually build some houses in Botswana. 
So these came from my sketchbook. Uh, so I thought I would share them with you because although Botswana and South Africa are thousands and thousands of miles away from West Africa, the building technique uh, in Botswana is almost identical. The buildings there are round and they're called rondavels and now they're made mostly of uh, sort of cinder block. So all that to say, we're getting to uh, the ballet door that is part of the Barnes collection. So I wanted to frame it in the context of how it would have functioned in um, a, a ballet um, community. Uh, our door uh, commands pride of place uh, on the second floor hallway uh, opposite Matisse's Bonaire de Vivre or Joy of Life. It was acquired in 1922-1923 from the French uh, dealer Paul Guillaume. There's a picture of Paul Guillaume at his desk there, uh, along with a number of other uh, African works. Um, these were originally uh, the spoils of colonial conquest. They were purchased, freely given, stolen, bought for a pittance. We, we don't really know. Um, uh, Coup d'Ivoire, after it was uh, the, the French uh, left in the late 19th century, uh, it was left in the care uh, of merchants, of resident merchants. In 1883, it was a protectorate, a colony in 1893, a territory of France in uh, 1904, and independent in 1960. So the whole history of Coup d'Ivoire um, and the acquisition of objects is, um, is, is a very curious one, a very interesting one. Now, Paul Guillaume is, is quite the character. He came from very humble beginnings. His father had been a, a tax collector in Paris. And Paul Guillaume uh, began his career uh, as a clerk in an auto garage. Uh, and the, the African sculpture uh, was um, from Coup d'Ivoire, um, arrived in crates of or rubber for rubber tires. So of course there was this sort of rubber trade um, and Paul Guillaume liked what he saw and he placed these works uh, in the window of the shop. Artists such as uh, Picasso, André Durand, Georges Braque, Maurice de Blaminck, and Henri Matisse saw these. And when Guillaume saw the interest that early moderns had in uh, African sculpture, uh, he opened his own gallery, uh, he displayed the African works along with the works of the early moderns. And uh, that was the beginning of his uh, career uh, as a uh, gallerist. And as we know, the Barnes Foundation collection was largely, uh, the African art collection was largely uh, purchased from Paul Guillaume. So, our door. Our door is carved in uh, bas-relief, and bas-relief is simply um, sort of about a, a quarter of an inch deep, no deeper than about a quarter of an inch. And on one side, in the lower half, is curiously rendered crocodile. Uh, it's seen from sort of an aerial view, and that's typical uh, of the presentation of the crocodile. Uh, the uh, crocodile is bilaterally symmetrical, uh, and it slightly uh, is sort of tilted to the right. Uh, simultaneously, I think we could see uh, the crocodiles as two crocodiles back to back in profile. The idea of a profile, the crocodile, stylistically for the ballet people is really unusual. I think this is one of the things that really got Dr. Barnes interested in this, that this is a very unusual presentation of the images. Um, I find that the door itself is, um, and the sort of presentation of a crocodile is boldly and confidently ambiguous. And I think that is something that is, is really intriguing uh, visually about the door. Um, the body um, show rows of triangular scales. Uh, the tails are long and curved and have incised lines infilled with white kaolin. Kaolin is a kind of white clay, it can be used um, as a marker for your body as well as, as a coloring for uh, a wooden door. And the red comes from red iron oxide that could have easily been uh, dug and found uh, locally. Uh, on the upper half, um, uh, above the crocodile, 
is a mask. And the mask, this particular mask is typical of the Baole people. Uh, the image appears to be a female figure with braided hair, with antelope horns, a narrow chin, and a small mouth. Um, noting that under that small mouth is a little bit of a hole, and we're going to see that hole on the other side as well. Um, we've seen other masks and uh, statuary of a similar form, uh, and these are were known as spirit wives. The idea that a man would have sort of one woman who would have been his kind of spiritual uh, sort of partner in life. And he would often sort of carve the image of the spirit wife uh, as, as sculpture. It would be hidden in the, his home only to be shown or taken out uh, very rarely. So we see examples of, of these as three-dimensional objects. And here it's carved into the surface. Uh, often these spirit wives uh, were an homage to a really powerful woman or a mother. Uh, they were carved by men to honor a woman for her wisdom, for her beauty, and her dance skills. Now above that, we see the bird figures perched on top, and they, they can have a range of meaning. Clairvoyance, love, fertility, power, danger, discipline, prudence, and laughter. The combination of symbols, or what art historians call iconography, is obscure to us. It's symbolic to the maker and the recipient of the door. Generally, again, the granary doors were there to ward off evil spirits and curious children. The surface of the wooden door is bicolored. Um, it's deep red, red iron oxide, white from kaolin. Uh, and as I said before, the, both of these kinds of colorings are also used as facial decorations for rituals. The reverse side is also a bas-relief in a kind of checkerboard in, again, white kaolin and red iron oxide. The hole uh, that we saw under the chin of the mask on the opposite reverse side sits nearly center um, of the checkerboard pattern. It's placed within a kind of coffered square, like a square within a square within a square. Uh, and this hole would have uh, had a handle fashioned from hide or from rope or raffia that had been woven. Uh, to our sensibility, it might seem as if uh, this hole is distracting uh, in terms of the, from the overall aesthetic of uh, the side. But we also need to remember that the creator of the door was not making art. Uh, it was made to conceal and reveal to conceal and safeguard the grain within, to reveal the powerful crocodile symbol. Uh, the meaning of the design is open for interpretation. Often the checkerboard pattern with its contrasts of dark and light represent duality, light and dark, night and day, male and female, opposing forces, good and evil, and the diamond pattern, when it's um, turned on the side, it almost looks like a harlequin pattern, it references frogs or fertility. So in this door from the Brucium, we can see that example of sort of fertility. As a granary door, its function is symbolic of the unity of the family and the jurisdiction of the family compound elder. It's interesting that the barn's door uh, features crocodiles and waterfowl. So this kind of brings us to this sort of interpretation of the sort of symbolism and that uh, there's some of the symbols we're just not going to know. But when we see these water symbols, it's fairly apparent that this is probably uh, referencing a kind of creation myth of the ballet people, which I find really fascinating and comes back to the idea of the power of the story, the power of the narrative when we interpret the symbols. So the um, myth of the um, ballet people is that their queen, Abla Poku, uh, needed to move her people from 
uh, the area in Ghana to the present day Côte d'Ivoire. And so uh, it was her job to get her people sort of cross the, the Moe River. When they got to the river, the river was so fierce that they weren't able to cross. And so uh, Queen uh, Abla Poku needed to make a sacrifice. And so she sacrificed what was most dear to her, which was her only son. So when she sacrificed her son, we are told in this uh, story that hippopotamus, hippopotami line up and they look like rocks and people are able to walk across the river and go to their new uh, home. So the idea that the crocodiles, the birds as waterfowl reference water, that there's a foundational notion of water as a threshold. Um, also, the word baule uh, is actually two words, bao and le, and baule means together, it means the sun is dead. So that the very core of the name of the people references that original myth of sacrificing uh, a son so that the people are, um, are safe. In this door uh, on the left, you can see that there's sort of a pin, a pin lock, which I think is a really fascinating thing. And partly that pin lock is a symbol of the unity of male and female, which seems obviously very appropriate for a granary door. And uh, to the uh, right of that, you can see uh, a sort of pair of, uh, of masks. And then between that pair of masks, a, um, a, tur a tortoise. Now I found this is really interesting that the pairing of two masks together um, is the double mask represents the marriage of the sun and moon. And it also represents uh, twins uh, whose birth is always an absolute uh, wonderful and good omen. I found in doing this research that the, there's one place in the world where uh, there's the highest form of, um, of having twins. And the idea is in Nigeria, that Nigeria of all the world has the largest uh, number of twins. So twins are um, really an important aspect. And Nigeria and, and Ghana and Côte d'Ivoire share many same uh, sort of traditions and traits. So I'm gonna make a little bit of a shift, and that shift is going to uh, sort of move us uh, in, a, in a slightly different direction, but I think you'll see why I'm doing this. Um, because I'm interested in looking at the door in a larger context and uh, the relationship of African art to European modernism within the Barnes Foundation. And I was curious in doing my research, like who were um, Dr. Barnes collaborators? Uh, how did um, these um, people influence uh, Dr. Barnes as a collector and as a, a thinker? So what I sort of put together is this group uh, of images. So on the uh, upper left is Alain Locke. Uh, I mentioned him before. He was a central graduate. He went to Harvard. And he was a great writer and a public intellectual. He was really involved in helping to shape this image of the new Negro and the Harlem Renaissance. So Dr. Barnes uh, really wanted to be able to have Ellen Locke tell the story of ancient uh, Negro art as a way to support um, the new movement of Harlem Renaissance. Uh, in the picture next to that, uh, there's uh, Violet de Maizia uh, and with a friend, Georgia O'Keeffe, and they are standing looking uh, in the main gallery at uh, Cezanne's uh, card players. And then next to them uh, is a photograph of uh, George Santayana, uh, who was a philosopher and who also just studied at Harvard and was very influential in, in Dr. Barnes structuring uh, his um, approach to education. And then, of course, John Dewey, the far right, is a very important, uh, again, um, person who helped Dr. Barnes shape his philosophy around education and around talking about art. Um, and then, of course, at the bottom, a, a little detail of uh, a painting by Picasso, Demoiselle d'Avignon, and then 
Next to that, our painting of, by Matisse, Bonaire de Vivre. Bonaire de Vivre was completed in about 1905, 1906, and then Picasso sees that in the apartments of uh, Leo and Gertrude Stein, and a year later he paints Demoiselle d'Avignon. Both um, artists very influenced by looking at um, African sculpture, things that were outside of the tradition of um, Europe. Uh, and then, of course, uh, Paul Guillaume, which I've shown you before. And the last photograph is of um, Horseman Bond, who was the president of Lincoln University, and he is uh, presenting Albert Einstein with an honorary degree. So these are just some of the people and some of the influences on Dr. Barnes as he's developing his idea around the collection and the primacy of African art within the collection. So here we have the exterior of the original building of the Barnes Foundation, designed by Paul Philippe Cray. And then within the um, entry area, the entry portico, Dr. Barnes did something that was just really extraordinary, um, starting really in, in 1925 when the Barnes Foundation opens, is the entrance is framed by African art from the collection. So uh, in this particular instance, he's got um, the ballet door imagery interpreted in Enfield tile uh, polychrome uh, clay. So I've got my colleague uh, Kedra there looking at there. And then you can see the in the center, the original signage for the Barnes Foundation established 1922 uh, on the gates outside of the Barnes Foundation on uh, Latches Lane. And you can see that Barnes was interested in having the Bowley door really as the first sort of branding for the Barnes Foundation. So how do uh, the contemporary architects, uh, Billy Shedd and Todd Williams, take the Parkway building and frame that within the context of African art? They do this in a particularly, I believe, uh, interesting and, uh, and subtle way. They, uh, I have a quote from them, which says that they wanted to wrap the building in a cloth of stone. So here we have a, a photograph of Ghanaian men making kente cloth. So these are looms that um, can make actually very, very long uh, strips of cloth. They're about six inches wide and sort of unlimited lengths. And they um, would have had uh, traditionally carved heddles and parts, but now you can see a combination of handmade works and then pieces of rubber and, and, and plastic to make the um, kente cloth. The kente cloth can be worn as a sash, a single sash. People may have seen these at graduation ceremonies often sort of African-American uh, students like to express uh, their uh, solidarity and heritage by wearing it as a sash. Also, the Akenti cloth can be sewn together to make a larger piece of cloth. So uh, the architects tell us that they were inspired by Kente cloth, the rhythms of Kente cloth, and you can see here the horizontal bands uh, on the exterior of the building. of the kente cloth, and then within the larger rectangular uh, spaces, the stone spaces, there are vari variations on that, um, on that kind of uh, stone uh, texture. And, and when you enter into the Annenberg light court, you'll cross a mosaic on the floor. The mosaic was drawn uh, by Billy Sheehan and then interpreted by a mosaic artist and it is based on the kente cloth, uh, which is called the liar's cloth, L-I-A-R apostrophe S, liar, as in someone who's not telling the truth. And the idea was that the liar's cloth would be worn by the chief in uh, the family compound when he had to uh, make some sort of uh, distinction between who's telling the truth and who's lying. And then, of course, in the main gallery, uh, when you enter in the original building, 
the plaster frieze and his interpretation of African sculpture the, and, and masks that were in, within the collection and also real sort of masks that they used. And the architects in uh, the Parkway building chose Kuba cloth as the um, uh, motif. And even in the light court, uh, in the uh, Florence Knoll uh, seat, seating arrangements, uh, the artists from Senegal uh, made the um, made the patterns for uh, the pa the uh, textiles. And then uh, when you're exiting the building, you'll see sort of a, a large uh, bronze wall, and it's etched with the image from the ballet door. So uh, the architects used subtle uh, textile uh, patterns as well as the original uh, ballet door image as they try to uh, make the image modern. Uh, the word that uh, continues to resurface for me in assessing uh, Barnes as a collector and his particular attachment to the ballet door is prescient. The idea of having or, or showing knowledge uh, of events before they take place. He was one of the first collectors in America to pair African art with uh, the early moderns. Uh, he disliked the notion that um, African art, Native American art, and material culture from non-Western cultures were relegated to ethnographic museums. He chose as his brand the ballet door at the inception of the foundation. I think that's pretty extraordinary. Uh, when Dr. Barnes made his second trip in 1912 to Paris and he met uh, Leo and Gertrude Stein, he saw an extraordinary painting in their apartments at um, the Matisse's uh, Bonheur de Vivre. And he was startled by the painting because of its vivid colors, its crude painting, its being curvilinear, ambiguous forms. But he was uh, simultaneously attracted and sort of repulsed by the painting. But he also recognized its position in, uh, in art history. Uh, the image clearly ruminated in his head for years. And then in 1923, he was able to purchase that uh, painting. So my argument is the painting didn't change. Dr. Barnes was transformed by it. Barnes championed African-American culture and for his time was considered progressive in terms of race and class. He yearned for America to fully accept the new Negro of the Harlem Renaissance as an equal. He established the Barnes Foundation as an educational institution challenging the visual uh, status quo in Philadelphia and I dare say in America. He was extremely confident in the transformational experience of art. By the way, on that image of Dr. Barnes on the left at the bottom, there's a sort of furry, like sort of black and white image. And I believe that is Dr. Barnes' uh, dog, Fidel, who uh, traveled with him sort of everywhere. So um, I love this photograph because Dr. Barnes um, clearly felt such a passion around the ballet door and about the centrality of African art uh, within the collection of the Barnes. That's it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Michael. That was fascinating. Um, just as you're, you were concluding with that photograph, I was thinking how I'm always so struck by the archival photos of Dr. Barnes um, touching <laughs> the, uh, yes, 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 touching. collection. I mean, he, yeah. he owned them, but you know, he's got that grip there. <laughs> he's got that grip. Oh, the uh, other thing about the door that's really interesting is that it's so very pristine. I mean, it, it, it doesn't show the sense of where that you would have an adore to a chief's house or to the family compound. So the granary seems like the logical place for it. And also I want to mention that there are pins at the top and the bottom, and you can see that they fit into the door stand. And those pins would have been 
uh, made to fit within the um, clay um, and uh, and and dung door uh, walls around the um, around the um, granary. So just a little technical thing. Yeah. So we got a number of questions throughout the presentation that I've compiled, and I tried to sort of mark in my own notes whether you would later address that. So, um, but I just I may not have. <laughs> I may I may be asking questions yeah, okay. that you may repeat a little bit. But, um, so one um, one of the questions that we got is: Did each family um, within the Bali people have its own granary, or were they shared? Oh, that's a great question. So uh, let's see, I had a diagram of the um, family compounds. Uh, they are, there might've been 10 to 15 families living within uh, a family compound. The walls are about four feet high. So, I mean, you can see obviously into the uh, family compound. The floor um, of the com compound gets swept every morning. So it's nice and neat. Um, and they would have had their own granaries. They could. They had the option of having their own granaries, which would have been smaller. And then, of course, they had the large granary that was the granary for the entire community, and that represented the community wealth. So I think I've, I answered that question. Yeah. So there are multiple granaries within one um, <laughs> compound. Great. Um, we're just as you're answering that. I think I just saw a question pop up on how did they get the grains in and out. Oh, um, there. Hmm, let's see. There was a photograph earlier on. I, I, it's, it's, I don't want to go back to it, but there is um, a ladder, and the ladder is made from a, a piece of wood that is a. It's kind of a Y shape. It almost looks like a slingshot, like a giant slingshot. That's what it looks like. It's kind of a Y at the top, and then there are notches um, leading that so that you can climb up into it. So they. I don't know how they got things out, but I know how they got things in through that door. Yeah. <laughs> well, great. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So um, we had a few questions on the colors. Um, and I do know this is something you did address. So I'll just kind of give you a few of these questions. Maybe you can just share a little more mm -hmm. information on that. Um, we did get a few people asking if they were intentionally different colors, which I think you then um, really spent some time on. But um, some of our members are wondering if the iron oxide was found in nature or is that something they kind of had to make? Um, and then also, I wonder if you could share a little bit about how you think those colors aged. Um, you know, are they, is that color what you might have expected to see back when it was originally created or do you think there's been a lot of sort of change there? Oh, these are great questions. Um, red iron oxide occurs naturally in the ground. And so people, uh, it's it's kind of like digging clay. If you go next to a stream, that you can look and you'll find some uh, deposits of clay that are. Um, they'd have to sort of break them apart and get some of the rocks out, but that's useful. And it's the same thing with the red iron oxide. It's a naturally occurring material. They'd have to do anything to it. And kaolin also is naturally occurring. It's a sort of a white clay. It's added to. Uh, porcelain is one of the uh, things that's used to create porcelain. Uh, so those would have been all naturally occurring. Uh, and the question, the other part of the question was, is this the condition that it was in originally? I think that was uh, the, the core of the question. Now, this creates a certain kind of problematic um, uh, idea is that a lot of the art from the latter half of the 19th century that came from West Africa, or objects, I shouldn't necessarily call them art, reliquary, that they um, were cleaned up for the market. So some of the things that we see that um, are kind of very black and clean and shiny were, um, were washed and cleaned and buffed and blackened, uh, that there had been raffia, which is a kind of, um, occurs in nature and you can use it for weaving. Uh, um, that would have been included in in masks, especially. Also, there would have been cowrie shells that are often attached to masks, and those are taken off. Um, so we do know that there's a lot of um, changes in the way that people created uh, works of art, works of um, importance in their culture. And in fact, by the latter half of the 19th century, probably the 1880s, 1890s, people in Cote d'Ivoire were actually creating 
some works for the sort of European uh, trade um, in, in objects, in African objects. So what we see in terms of the condition um, is unlikely to have been sort of the original condition. In fact, many of the objects, I'm thinking of sculpture, in the rituals would have been sort of anointed with um, um, blood, um, either human sacrifice blood or probably an animal like a chicken, and those things would have been cleaned off. If you see original uh, works, they will be often caked with blood uh, because they were used over and over again in different rituals. Interesting. Well, <laughs> yeah. I suppose I must be glad that uh, the Barnes ballet door is not caked in <laughs> blood. Yeah. It would be unlikely um, for the doors to have been used caked in, in blood because they didn't do that. Right, right. Okay. Understood, I see. Um, okay. I'm going to jump back a little bit to the idea of different mm -hmm. greeneries within compound and ask if different granaries, um, if those different granaries would have different designs on their doors, would there sort of be a uniformity or or would there be different designs? Oh, let's see, the doors that I have seen, crocodiles, uh, turtles, sometimes a fish, again, uh, water related, and it seems to be water related based on that early sort of creation myth. Uh, with Abla Puka, the um, queen. Yeah, so um, the range of images, but the range of images is relatively narrow. Hmm, I see. Uh, okay. And we did get a question, which I think ties in here, is asking, um, were hippos used in the design? Um, I know you mentioned that the hippopotamus was a big part of that um, sort of founding uh, mythology and perhaps we did see some um, different designs so I think maybe if you could just unpack whether we were looking at were we looking at hippos were we looking at crocodiles uh, we were looking at crocodiles uh, turtles um, there were some uh, men on horseback with um, from that this is from a, a the door from the, the mat and as I didn't know what the symbolism was I just um, didn't talk about them. Uh, and they, they were probably later and they were related to the, the colonial history of um, mm -hmm. Cote d'Ivoire. Apparently in Cote d'Ivoire, um, the uh, people who were living there um, really resisted uh, French rule. So there was a fair amount of, um, of sort of warfare back and forth and skirmishes. So, uh, so you know, that this door, I don't know um, it, its provenance around the, the horse horsemen, but mostly it's crocodiles, fish, turtle, birds. Interesting. Yeah. Um, on that door, actually, that we just took a look at, there were, you know, the people on horseback and on the upper right, there's that long object with two circles. Is that what you're saying? You're not sure what that is and that could be related to colonialism? Yeah. It's sort of, okay, interesting. Yeah, and it's, it's, um, it's interesting because, um, Interpreting the symbols is relatively hard to do, and um, I, because people, they're, they're sort of idiosyncratic based on the maker and the person who was being made for, um, mm. so I, I don't know. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Um, maybe, and this, this is a question we've received, what, what type of art are the ballet people making now, or if, if any? Oh, wow, that is a great question. Um, hmm. They are, uh, let's see, as far as I know, I mean, some people are making works for the trade. So they're making imitations of doors and uh, masks and sculpture, but they're doing them for the trade. They're not doing them for a uh, symbolic reason. Uh, the spirit uh, wives or the spirit spouses, uh, people are still carving and they really don't share those. They are hidden away and uh, they will take them out for sort of limited ceremonies. Then, I mean, they're making art that is informed by the West. Uh, so, um, you know, architecturally, you know, sort of Western influenced. I uh, don't really have like a Great answer for that. Other than in Nigeria, there is an artist who's passed away. His name is Twin Seven Seven, and he did 
did very large uh, figures and animals, uh, highly decorated. And his name comes from he was the seventh twin to survive uh, his sort of a, a live birth. So that's how he got the name uh, Twin Seven Seven. So that's kind of related back to the image of the two uh, spirit wife masks. Uh, but um, I don't know all kinds of work. People are there. Yeah, it's a broad, a broad question. But no, I think that's a good, yeah. that's a great answer. Very yeah. interesting. Of course, once a market has been created, you want to fill that market, but it doesn't necessarily mean that that's sort of what they're currently um, interested in. How can you tell, oh, I think this is a really fascinating question. How can you tell which reliquaries are authentic versus those made for trade? And, and maybe we can't. Oh, okay. Uh, I am not an expert, uh, so I don't, I don't know. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I think people actually really have a hard time with that. It, it's kind of, people really have a hard time. Remember that they're wood, things don't last a long time. So uh, they would tend to rot if they were in sort of an area that was lots of moisture. So uh, we're not an expert on authentication of uh, African objects. Um, yeah, <laughs> well, that makes sense. We appreciate your sharing your knowledge with us, <laughs> authentication or not. Okay. Um, so here's um, something I think you did um, touch on briefly, but maybe we can just spend another moment on it, is how would these objects have been procured from the ballet people? Oh, well, that's interesting. So uh, at the time, as I understand it, when Paul Guillaume was actually acquiring objects, uh, Cote d'Ivoire was in the hands of these sort of resident merchants. So you can imagine like just people going there and buying stuff. People would go into a village uh, and purchase things or trade objects. Um, the ballet people were really interested in sort of Western objects. So they were pretty much, except for the spirit wives, happy to trade things. Um, so that was it. Uh, they also could in sort of ripped out of village i mean i really don't know um and uh it is um one of the great um dilemmas of the 21st century is how people acquire objects from all different cultures um and how people um bring objects back uh, to their sort of rightful owners so i think that exists for african objects as well yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. So we have, I think, you know, really, we do have other questions that really want to dig into some of the technical things that you covered, but um, we're, we're coming close to the end of our program. And I kind of like uh, ending on that ambiguous note, you know, we can appreciate um, our opportunity to take a look at these works, but always nice to sort of wonder about their past lives and how they ended up um, here at the Barnes. But um, I really want to thank you so much for taking the time to um, to share all of this incredible research and, and knowledge uh, with us here today. Um, this is quite a fascinating presentation um, for myself and we've gotten a lot of <laughs> positive feedback um, in the chat as well. Um, anyone listening who wants to um, hear more from Michael, you can do that at, at the Barnes. Um, he gives art team talks in the Annenberg Court. So um, whenever you are ready to visit, I, I encourage you to um, to stop by, you'll be able to, to hear more from him. Um, as you uh, may know, we are open. We're excited to welcome you back. Uh, you can learn more about our safety procedures on the website, um, and we'll post that link in the chat. And we ask that you make a reservation to visit in advance. Our capacity is quite limited um, so that we can keep everybody uh, safe and spread out. Um, in March, we will open a new exhibition, Soutine de Kooning, Conversations in Paint, which explore the affinities between the work of Haim Soutine and Willem de Kooning. Uh, this exhibition has been called the season's major art exhibition by the Philadelphia Inquirer, and it will be open to members first on March 4th and 5th before it opens to the public on March 6th. 
We'll also be hosting a virtual curatorial preview on March 3rd. So I hope you'll join us online for that. You can register for that on our website. Additional virtual programming continues as well. Uh, we post a new Barnes Takeout video on our YouTube channel every Friday. And for members, uh, we have another exclusive lecture in March with Tamara Mason, another member of our incredible Barnes Art team. It's titled Soutine, Rembrandt, and Hardeen. So she will be looking at the way uh, Soutine was influenced by um, artists that came before. So a nice tie into the exhibition will kind of consider how um, de Kooning was inspired in a lot of ways by CT. Our winter adult education classes are enrolling now. We have a number of semester long courses as well as monthly offerings. Um, as a member, you get a 10% discount on your registration. And if you need assistance registering, please give us a call at 215-278-7100. We are so grateful for your interest in and support of the Barnes. We miss you and we look forward to seeing you again, hopefully here <laughs> for the curatorial preview or for our next talk. Um, and please feel free to post additional questions in the chat or reach out to us at members at barnesfoundation.org. Happy Valentine's Day and have a great weekend.